God in our Sunday morning series of studies in the book in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms where we reach Psalm number 64 <clears throat> and by way of introduction to Psalm 64 we read from the New Testament from the Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 3 where we read the first six verses the Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 3 at verse 1 Again, <clears throat> Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched him to see whether Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come here. And he said to the people, including their leaders, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. Now turn to Psalm number 64. Psalm number 64, a psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. <clears throat> Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the scheming of evildoers, who whet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast to their evil purpose, they talk of laying snares, secretly thinking, who can see us? Who can search out our crimes? We have thought out a cunningly conceived plot. For the inward mind and heart of a man are deep. But God will shoot his arrow at them. They will be wounded suddenly. Because of their tongue, he will bring them to ruin. All who see them will wag their heads. Then all men, that is the whole of society, will fear. They will tell what God has wrought and ponder what God has done. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart glory in God. Amen, and may God bless to our hearts the reading of his word. <coughs> now will you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm number 64. When you first read through a psalm like this, you can't help wondering, as I certainly wondered, what is it all about? If you read through the psalm quickly and superficially, it seems, and I underline the word seems, that David is asking God to inflict all kind of judgment on his enemies. But that is not so. If you read through the psalm carefully and slowly, and we should always read the Bible carefully, you will see that in verses 1 and 2 that David uses significant words, hear me, protect me, hide me. Then in verses 3 to 6, he describes the people who are against him or whom he feels are against him. In verses 7, 8, and 9, he states, he doesn't ask, he simply states or affirms what God will do. 
And then in verse 10, we have what is really the final request of the psalm. Let the righteous rejoice and take refuge and glory or give praise to God. Now when I began to prepare a sermon on this psalm, I went to the commentaries. And Alexander McLaren has a two or a three volume commentary on the book of Psalms, an excellent commentary. But at the beginning of Psalm 64, he says, This is a psalm with familiar notes, but no very distinctive features. And I thought, well, that's going to be a lot of help. So then I turned to the three-volume commentary by Dr. J. Elder Cumming, who way, way back was the second minister of Sandyford, a godly, devout man. And he says of Psalm 64 that we should think of this as one of the messianic psalms pointing forward to Jesus. And this is why we read that very short passage in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3 where the chief priests and the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jewish people, having seen the authority and the power of Jesus Christ to heal and to save, they immediately took counsel together to destroy him. And if you read through the Gospels carefully, you will see that constantly there were these people who outwardly were very religious, <coughs> But all the time, they were saying things or asking things, trying to trap Jesus. And later on, of course, at the time of the crucifixion, these same people bribed witnesses to take the oath and go into the witness stand and commit perjury and tell lies against Jesus. Another commentary in the Psalms by Dr. Campbell Morgan, who was in Westminster Chapel in London before Martin Lloyd-Jones, <coughs> says with regard to verse 1 of this psalm, and he refers to soldiers, sailors and airmen and all that kind of thing in the First World War and the Second World War, and he said very often what they were really afraid of was being afraid <laughs> wonder if that makes sense to you. So sort of, I, w I wonder, will I cope or will I be afraid? And so, well, I shouldn't be, especially if I'm a Christian, I shouldn't be afraid. You can be afraid of being afraid. And I found that a useful way eh, to introduce myself to the study of this psalm. So consider it this way. Do you ever feel... <coughs> that everyone and everything is against you. You may say, oh, often. Uh, if you're saying, oh, often, well, I agree with you. I know exactly what you mean. Do you ever feel that everyone and everything is against you? You may not have any clear evidence, but you feel quite sure that everybody is out to do you down. And from the moment you open your eyes in the morning, this thought comes into your mind and the appropriate feelings begin to stir. Your reaction is the same as David's here in verse 1 of Psalm 64. And I think the word used in the Revised Standard Version is the best of the three words. Preserve my life from dread. The authorised version translates it fear. The New International Version it translates it threat. But I think the feeling of the word is expressed in this word dread. A, a strange, almost unidentified, but very deep feeling of apprehension. Now, when you take these words on board and begin to read the psalm, you become aware that this thought of dread runs right through it. Now, when we have this kind of feeling of dread, the, the explanation could be that we are clinically depressed. And as a result, we see everything 
in dark aspects. On the other hand, when we have this feeling of dread, it could be factual. Because there could be people who are out to bring us down. Nothing would give them more pleasure than to see us falling flat on our faces, preferably in public. Or on the other hand, this feeling of dread, this, this strange, unsettling apprehension could be there because we are just so totally tired, physically, mentally, and emotionally, that we are incapable of thinking straight or feeling authentically. Now, the point is, if any of these circumstances are our experience, then simply because we are Christians, we are Christ's people, we want to be true to him, we want to do the will of God, we want to live our lives to please God. Simply because that is what we truly are, then we have to recognize that there is an enemy. And the enemy, who of course call him Satan, call him the devil, call him the accuser, call him any name you like, the enemy is out above all else to steal our peace. I don't think the devil is primarily concerned to lead us into gross and ugly and terrible sin. Although if, if he can do that, he'll do it. But what he is always seeking to do is to steal from us our peace. That peace which Simply because we are Christians, we are entitled to have. Didn't Jesus say, remember our studies in John's Gospel, chapter 14? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Oh, the devil must have been furious to hear these words. And I believe from that point, I before that point and ever since that point, he has done his best or done his worst to dis starve our peace and if at all possible to take it away from us altogether and to make us afraid now this is the note of psalm number 64 there is evil at work whether evil people or evil spirits or the devil himself. Ah, but you say, preacher, <clears throat> there's no mention at all, there's not even a hint of the devil in Psalm number 64. Of course there isn't. The devil prefers to work incognito, unrecognized, so that when our peace is disturbed or stolen from us and there comes upon us this feeling of dread, we will either feel terribly guilty or we'll fasten on some person and we'll blame them. When all the time it is the enemy. Now look what David did. In verses 1 and 2, he addresses himself to God. He speaks to God. Now, for a Christian believer, that should be something very natural. I, I'm always a little disappointed when, when Christian people, especially those who ought to know better by now, when they're speaking to God, feel that they must put it into very religious, very proper religious language. That's nonsense. After all, is not God our loving Heavenly Father? And when you speak to a loving Father, you, you don't spend a few hours preparing a speech and then go with a full manuscript to address yourself to your... Of course you don't. You... You just blurt it out. 
And this is what David does here. He speaks to God in exactly the same way as he spoke to God in Psalm number 43. Oh, send thy light forth and thy truth. Let them, oh, says, says David to the psalmist in that time, David, David said, oh God, everything's rather confused. I'm not quite sure where I am or where I should be going. Send forth thy light and thy truth and, and guide me. And then later on in Psalm 43, have, in the course of speaking to God, David begins to speak to himself and says, now come on, David, what, what's this all about? Why are you cast down? Why are you disturbed? Still trust in God for him to praise. Good cause I yet shall have. We, we may not have cause to rejoice in God by lunchtime today or by tea time today or even by tomorrow morning. But just wait. In due time, says David, because God is to be trusted, you will have cause to praise his name. So David says, Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Now, to use a good Scots word, he's, he's not gurning. He's expressing to God his troubled thoughts. Now, I've heard people say to you, oh, but Mr. Lip, I've just been I've just been so confused about everything, I just haven't been able to pray. But why? If, if you're confused and if your thoughts are confused and if your feelings are confused, the one thing you should do is to speak to God. I, I hesitate to say it like this, but you know, the Almighty is remarkably intelligent and he can usually latch on to what we are meaning even if we get into an awful verbal knot about it. And so David says, Oh, hear my voice, O oh God, in my complaint as I express my troubled thoughts. And then he becomes more specific. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Now this word that I indicated is variously translated dread or fear or threat. I'm sure the best word is dread. It speaks about a deep apprehension. You know how sometimes people say, but, but, but what's the matter with you? I don't know. Oh, and we, oh, we get all sorts of wise spiritual. Oh, well, if, 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 if it's not specific, then it can't be coming to God, from God because God is always specific and he's guiding. It must. But you know, that's often not, not a great deal of help. This kind of ap deep apprehension is something that steals our peace. But you know, it does more than that. It steals our peace. It robs us of energy. It makes us tired. A particular kind of... It's not physical tiredness. Perhaps I should say it's, it's a weariness that comes upon us. And this, this apprehension that we are speaking about is something that distracts us from everything else. You don't care if the house is untidy. You don't care if letters aren't answered. You don't care if you promised to phone somebody and you haven't phoned them. Nothing. Oh, there's, there's just, there's this apprehension, there's this deep down unease. And as I've said several times already, it's, it's usually not focused on anything. It's almost here in the psalm as if David is saying, well, God, you, if, if I knew exactly what was going on, I would be able to deal with it, if I could. It's the fact that he doesn't know what... <laughs> Remember somebody once saying to me, I, I don't mind having problems as long as I know what the problem is. I could sympathize with that. This is what we are dealing with here. But then you see, oftentimes, there is nothing that you can do. The unease is still there. So David speaks to God. He prays. I'm deliberately saying, he speaks. When we use the word prayer, you know, 
All sorts of people that always were, were into a difficult realm. Of course, nothing of the sort. Prayer is speaking to God. Oh, but you say, Mr. Lee, you can't speak to somebody that you don't know. I was out walking along the, along the seashore when I was on holiday through in five, and I met several people that I'd never seen in my life, before, but I spoke to them. It seemed a natural thing to do. Well, you know, if you're a Christian, it should be the most natural thing for you to do to speak to God. No, no, you don't have to come to church. You don't have to go down on your knees. You don't have to read your Bible. For, you can be washing the dishes. You can be scrubbing the floor. You can be doing the ironing. I better not say you could be doing things in the office because you should be concentrating if you're doing things in the office. But speak to God. And David says, Oh God, hear me. Preserve me. Hide me. He, he is aware of an enemy. He is aware of fear beginning to grip him and to unsettle him. There's, there's so much that he doesn't know about his situation and he feels, well, it, it would just be so easy to panic. At that point in my sermon preparation, I turned back a page or two in my Bible to Psalm number 56. And I've told you this before, but I tell you it again. I've got it underlined with red biro in my Bible. Psalm number 56, the beginning of verse 3 and towards the end of verse 4. I'll read the two verses. When I am afraid, I put my trust in thee, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust without a fear. What can flesh do to me? But I've linked up. When I am afraid, I trust without a fear. One translation has it. When I am afraid, I will not be afraid. Oh, you say, that's a contradiction. All right, if you want to describe it as a contradiction, fair enough. But it's true and it's practical. When you're afraid, you have to say, now, now God, I, I remember what the man said from Psalm 56. When I am afraid, I will not be afraid. And at this point in the psalm, David seems somewhat more calm, and he begins to consider in some detail what is going on. And so in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 of the psalm, he describes or he identifies the enemies. And he identifies, the, he describes the nature of their actions, and he exposes them for what they are. In verse 2, hide me from the secret plots of the wicked. You see, there are those who are operating behind David's back. Do you know the kind of situation I mean? In verse 3, he speaks, those who whet their tongues like swords and aim bitter words like arrows. We haven't time this morning, but I commend it to you to read in the epistle of James, chapter 3, beginning at verse 6, just a few verses after that, where it speaks about the tongue is a fire set on fire of hell. If time had permitted I might have been tempted to say some very plain words about gossip. Because there are people, you see, who like to know about things in order to pass them on. Sometimes when people ask you leading questions, especially questions about other people, To really say to them, why do you want to know? The tongue is a very dangerous weapon, and gossip is a very great sin. And David here in verse 3 speaks about those who are talking behind 
his back. He can be referring to statements or accusations, or shall we say he may be referring to hints. You know the kind of thing people say, well, you know, it's not for me to say, but, That hellish work. Be very, very careful. And David here speaks about those who aim bitter words like arrows. Words that are spoken with the deliberate intention of hurting. The deliberate intention, like a sharp arrow, of stabbing. And in verse 4 he speaks about shoot those who shoot these arrows from ambush. Shooting at him suddenly and without fear. Oh, you see, Mr. Williams, shouldn't this be making us think of Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10, you know, all about spiritual warfare and the fiery darts of the wicked one? Yes, I've got Ephesians 6 marked down in my notes. But you see, but you see one of the emphasis here: these fiery arrows, these sharp pricks, that are guaranteed to make you jump. At a little time in the garden the other day, raking up leaves, and as I did, my hand just came along past a rose, and the thorn went into my eye. It made me jump. Words can do that. But then you see, when the enemy, by whatever means he does it, when the enemy throws the fiery dart and it it pricks us, hurting us like that, there's an immediate reaction that is almost certain to bring a degree of panic. And of course, panic disturbs our peace and steals it away from us. When we come to verse 5, we see that David is saying these evil things that these evil people are doing are quite deliberate. They hold fast to their evil with purpose. It's quite calculated. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see us? Oh, they're, they're so sure of themselves. Who can see us? Notice David is saying, they... There's more than one of them. There's a group of them. And you know, when church history is written in full, when we see things as they really are, there will be many stories of how little groups of discontented, bitter people have at times destroyed the work of God in a whole congregation. And they say, who can see? They, you see, they're encouraging each other to go on doing what they're doing. Oh, they, no, nobody will ever know. Can I quote you Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13? All things are open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Every word, every motive, every action is seen and known by God. And in verses 7, 8, and 9... David begins to realize, begins to be aware of this, that there is no need for him to panic. There is no need for him to lose his peace. There is no need for him to try to deal with (coughs) this evil that is surrounding him. There is no need for him to answer those who are speaking falsely. There is no need for him to contradict what is being said and what is being done. Oh no, he says, God will deal with that. God will shoot his arrow at them. They will be wounded suddenly because of their tongue. God will bring them to ruin and all who see them, it will become public. All who see them will wag their head. Then all means, that is, with, within the realm of both the church and the society there will be a new, healthy fear of God. God will shoot his arrow at them. Yes, 
when they least expect it, God will deal with them. And when they, are least, when, when they least expect it, God will expose them for what they are. And it will be manifest to all who have eyes to see that they are false. And that they have spoken falsely. And that they have acted falsely. Oh, I hope, I hope there are not many people in church this morning who have things that they want to hide. You can't hide. God is the great bringer of things out into the open. And so we come to the very last verse of our psalm. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him because there's peace there. Let all the upright in heart glory. If you want to be right, if you want to do right, take refuge in God and rejoice. The psalm began with David gripped by fear and aware of a deep, deep apprehension that made him burdened and restless. But the psalm ends with David speaking about peace and hope and joy. And you know, these are the three words that fill my mind and touch my heart as we come to the Lord's table. Peace, hope, joy. These are ours in God's redeeming love. Yes, we'll read at the Lord's table as we usually read. Jesus said, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're apprehensive. You're restless. You're uncertain. There's fear. Oh, you say, Mr. Philip, there's even dread. But I bid you come to the Lord's table. Can I remind you of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I do so in the words of this old hymn? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear as the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is this aught to him? Does he see? And the chorus, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. A sentimental hymn? Would you say the signpost that points to the costly cross of Calvary is sentimental? Oh, my dear people, I bid you Listen to Jesus when he says, Come unto me. Now we sing our communion hymn.